Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome to tonight's lecture. Uh, my name is Yoav Kallis. I am an Amidiar Fellow at the Santa Fe Institute. It is my pleasure to be introducing tonight's speaker. Um, Professor Ellen Lightman is both an accomplished astrophysicist and a prolific and best-selling novelist and essayist. He is coming to us uh, from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he is the professor of the practice of humanities. Yeah, <laughs> professor of the practice of the humanities, uh, which is a position that where he gets to teach both physics and creative writing, which is wonderful. Uh, the title of tonight's talk it comes from uh, his recent book of essays called The Accidental Universe, The World You Thought You Knew. His essays bring to light, um, bring a light touch to some of the most heavy and unanswerable questions about the nature of the universe. He manages um, to bring to light how much we know about the universe today that we did not know even 10 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. And as the subtitle suggests, how much what we thought we knew we didn't really know. So with that, let us welcome Professor Ellen Lightman. Thank you, thank you. It's a, a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, I had the pleasure today to, to spend the day at the Santa Fe Institute, which was my first visit. And uh, I thank the, the Santa Fe Institute for inviting me here. Uh, in my own career, I've always uh, seen great value in interdisciplinary work. And that principle lies at the, at the core of the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, so I really admire that. Well, um, I, uh, the, my book, The Accidental Universe, um, covers uh, a, a lot of different topics. All of them deal with the ways that modern science has um, has changed our understanding of ourselves and our place in the universe. Um, uh, there are a lot of philosophical and theological issues brought up in, uh, in the book, and I'm not going to be able to talk about all of them tonight, but I'll try to talk about a few of the issues. Um, and I'll see how much time we have. Um, until very recently, scientists believed that all the phenomena of the physical universe could be understood as necessary consequences of a small number of fundamental laws of nature. Uh, and by uh, a, law of, a fundamental law of nature, I mean something like Einstein's principle that there is no, there's no point of absolute rest in the universe. There's no such thing as absolute rest. Uh, that's an example of a fundamental principle. Um, and from that principle, Einstein erected his theory of relativity. Um, so from, uh, with a small number of fundamental principles like that one and a small number of fundamental parameters like the mass of the electron and the speed of light, science has been very successful in explaining a, a large range of phenomena from the orbits of planets to the color of the sky to the size of raindrops, many, many other phenomena. We've been su su successful in explaining. And until recently, uh, we believed that uh, given a small number of fundamental laws and parameters that there was only one uh, universe that was possible, one unique universe, like a crossword puzzle that has only one solution. 
very recently we've learned that this belief is probably wrong. Starting with the same fundamental principles, the same fundamental laws, and the same parameters, um, it appears that a large variety of universes is possible uh, with many different properties. Some universes might have 17 dimensions or 23 dimensions. Some of them might have complex molecules like DNA and hemoglobin as in our universe. Some of them may have only subatomic particles. Some of them may have planets and stars like in our universe. Some may be completely empty. Um, some uh, may have conditions that allow life to emerge, and some may not. It appears that our particular universe is just an accident, a random throw of the dice. Um, and if so, there are many properties of our universe that are incalculable from fundamental laws that we have to just take as accidents. This collection of all possible universes is called the multiverse. And some of you may have heard that term before. It sounds like a word in one of Robert Heinlein's science fiction novels. Needless to say, these uh, recent findings are very upsetting to scientists, and especially to theoretical physicists. Theoretical physicists want to be able to explain all the properties of our universe as necessary consequences of a small number of fundamental laws and parameters. And to find out that they cannot do that, that there are a huge number of universes possible from the same starting point with many different properties, that's uh, very upsetting. And let me try to give you an analogy. Um, it's sort of like going into a shoe store and finding that a, nine, a size 9 shoe fits you, and a size 12 fits you equally well, and a size 15 fits you equally well. So why has our uh, belief changed recently? for two reasons. Um, one, to explain certain odd, odd uh, features of our universe. And secondly, because there are actually some modern theories of physics that predict the multiverse, that predict this large number of universes. So I want to say a little bit about these two things now. Um, back in the 1960s, uh, physicists noticed that certain parameters of our universe appear to be fine-tuned for the emergence of life. And when I say life, I don't mean life like human beings or even life like on our planet. I mean life of any form. And when I, mean, mean, when I say fine-tuned, I mean that if, if certain parameters were a little, little larger than they actually are, or a little smaller than they actually are, that life could never have arisen in our universe. Um, one example is the strength of the nuclear force. The nuclear force is the force that holds the subatomic particles, the neutrons and the protons, together at the centers of atoms. And if the nuclear force were only a, a few percent larger than what it actually is in our universe, then all of the hydrogen in the early universe would have fused with helium, uh, would have uh, uh, fused to make helium, it would have fused together to make helium. There would be no, no hydrogen left in our universe, and no hydrogen means no water. And biologists uh, agree that probably you need water to have life. On the other hand, if the nuclear force were just a little bit weaker than it is, then you would not be able to create complex atoms like carbon, silicon, nitrogen that we think are almost certainly necessary for life. So the, the actual value of the nuclear force in our universe lies within a narrow range to allow 
the emergence of life. Another example uh, of this fine tuning is what uh, astronomers and physicists call dark energy. And this was discovered recently in the, in the late 1990s. Dark energy is an energy that pervades all of space. We call it dark because we can't see it. And it leads to a, an effective anti-gravitational force. Normal gravity pulls things together. Dark energy leads to a gravitational force that pushes things apart. So when we look at distant galaxies, we actually see them accelerating away from each other. Um, by measuring the rate of expansion of the universe, we know the universe is expanding, uh, and with the discovery of dark energy, we actually see that it's accelerating, not just expanding, but it's like somebody has their foot down on the cosmic gas pedal. And by measuring the rate of expansion of the universe in different epochs of time, uh, we can calculate the, the value of the dark energy how much dark energy there is. And it's a particular number, it's about 100,000th, I'm sorry, 100 millionth of an erg per cubic centimeter. Now an erg, that's a unit of energy. If I drop a penny, a penny on the floor from waist high, that's a few hundred thousand ergs. So 100 millionth of an erg per cubic centimeter may not sound, seem like very much energy, but, uh, Space is very large. Just in this room here, there are, there are thousands of ergs of dark energy just in this auditorium. And if you go to the reaches of space, to stars and galaxies, that builds up to a very, very large amount of dark energy because the volumes are so large. But the important point here is that we've measured a specific value of this dark energy, 100 millionth of an erg per cubic centimeter. Now, here's where the rub comes in the fine-tuning. If the dark energy were just a little bit larger than it actually is, then the universe would expand so rapidly, would accelerate so rapidly, that matter would never be able to clump together to form stars and planets. Uh, because it would be dispersing too rapidly to cluster together to make planets and stars. And if the dark energy were just a little bit less than it actually is, then the universe would have recollapsed long before you could form stars. And we all, all scientists agree that the chemical elements in the planet and our bodies heavier than hydrogen were made at the centers of stars. So you have to form a star in order to form chemical elements, and you need chemical elements to make life. To give you an idea of how narrow this range is that the dark energy must be to allow the emergence of life, um, starting from the same fundamental laws, uh, the dark energy could be anywhere from trillions of trillions of trillions of ergs per cubic centimeter to one, to one trillionth of one, to, to negative trillions of trillions of trillions of ergs per cubic centimeter. And the value in our universe happens to be only 100, 000, 100 millionth of an erg per centimeter. That is very close to the middle of that enormous range. If we're just a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller than it actually is, then life could never have emerged in our universe. So these are two examples of, of parameters, the strength of the nuclear force and the value of the dark energy in our universe that appear to lie within a very narrow range permitting the emergence of life. Either a little bigger or, or a little smaller than they actually are, life could not have arisen. So the great question is why? Why do the parameters of our universe appear to be finely tuned? <clears throat> Does our universe care about life? After all, we, can, we could have a universe of totally inanimate matter. 
Well, there are a couple of different explanations or answers to this question why. One is intelligent design. Uh, perhaps there was a, an intelligent being uh, that created the universe, and that being wanted there to be life, and therefore that being uh, tuned the parameters, created the parameters of the universe to allow the emergence of life. That's one explanation. But for the, the great majority of scientists, um, the intelligent design argument is not appealing. Um, so there's another explanation which does not require an intelligent designer, and that is the multiverse. According to the multiverse, there are lots of different universes with many different values of the fundamental parameters, some with nuclear forces much larger than the nuclear force in our universe, some with nuclear forces much smaller than the nuclear force in our universe, some with what much larger values of dark energy than in our universe, some with much smaller values of dark energy. And um, in most of these universes will be dead, lifeless conglomerations of matter and energy. But we, by definition, because we're here to talk about it, we live in one of the small fraction of universes that have the right values of those parameters to allow the emergence of life, to allow the creation of stars, to allow the creation of planets, to allow the creation of complex molecules. We have to inhabit such a universe or we wouldn't be here. But you can see that the multiverse explanation does not require a divine creator, an intelligent designer. Um, an analogy to this kind of explanation um, of the fine-tuning is the following. Suppose uh, we began wondering um, why it is that the Earth has such amenable conditions for life. We have a, a magnetic field that shields us from the, from the uh, solar wind, which would be very devastating to life. We have oxygen, we have water, we're at the right temperature from our sun so that it's not too hot and not too cold. Water's not evaporated, it's not frozen. It's in liquid form, which is very conducive to life. And so why is it that Earth has, has all of these wonderful conditions? Aren't we lucky? So we might, uh, we might begin uh, wondering about that and asking how that came about. Uh, we might propose that, that some des uh, intelligence designer created the Earth this way for our benefit. But then we look at other planets in our solar system and we find that there are a range of different atmospheres and temperatures and so on that are not conducive to life. Uh, for example, on Uranus, the temperature is minus 371 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, very, very cold. Um, and on Venus, the rain is sulfuric acid. So when all of the other uh, planets in our solar system conditions are not right for life. We are on a planet that has the right conditions for life because otherwise we wouldn't be here to talk about it. So the, the, the explanation of the multiverse, uh, that is an explanation for the fine tuning of our universe as a whole. It's very similar to this analogy with the conditions of life on Earth. However, there's a trade-off for scientists in accepting the multiverse explanation of the fine-tuning. That trade-off uh, is that the historic mission of science, and especially the historic mission of physics, to be able to explain all the properties of our universe as necessary consequences of a small number of fundamental laws, that historic mission is futile. Many of the properties of our universe are what they are just by accident. And there are other universes with very different properties starting from the same fundamental laws. Our, our, we are here um, because our universe is what it is. 
our universe is what it is because we are here. Um, and let me give a, another analogy. Suppose that we have a population of very intelligent fish. And the fish begin to argue, the fish notice that, that their world is full of water, which is very nice for the existence of fish. And they begin to argue about uh, why it's all water. And uh, some of the theoretical fish say, well, um, there's probably a, a, a reason from fundamental principles why the world has to be water. And they've been calculating and calculating and calculating to show why everything must be water. And they never can qu they're never quite up to the task. Um, and then one day, a group of wizened old fish says that maybe they're just fooling themselves. Maybe there are other worlds that don't have water, that are dry, and they just happen to live in a world with water because otherwise they wouldn't be there. So let me turn now to uh, a couple of modern theories of physics that actually predict the existence of the multiverse. Um, the argument I've given so far is really not a prediction, it's an explanation of this fine-tuning observation that was made in the 1960s, that the parameters of our universe appear to be finely tuned to allow the existence of, of life. There are actually some, some theories in physics that predict the existence of other universes. One is string theory, uh, which was formulated in the late 1960s and onward. Uh, string theory um, uh, is a fundamental theory of physics that uh, attempts to unify all of the different forces that we no know, and it rests on a, on a fundamental principle that the, the basic constituents of matter are not particles, but tiny one-dimensional vibrations of energy that are called strings. And from those vibrations, um, all of the forces and particles that we know of are produced. Um, another aspect of string theory is that uh, in addition to the three dimensions that we know about, there's seven additional spatial dimensions. We don't see them because they are curled up in tiny loops, ultra tiny loops like looking at a garden hose from a, from a distance. And if you look at it from a distance, it looks just like a one-dimensional line. You can't see the other dimensions because you're too far away. That's sort of uh, the way these ultra-tiny dimensions of string theory behave. Now, there's been no, confirmation, no, no, no experimental confirmation of string theory to date, but some of the brightest theoretical physicists in the world have been working on it for 40 years. Well, these extra seven dimensions of string theory are folded up into a very tiny size uh, to make only three large-scale dimensions that we experience. And it turns out that there are zillions of different ways that these other dimensions can be folded up, like many, many different ways of folding up a piece of paper. And each different way of folding up these other seven dimensions corresponds to a different universe with different properties. So string theory predicts that there are many, many other different universes besides ours with different properties. There's another um, theory of modern physics called internal, eternal inflation, which also predicts the multiverse. Um, inflation uh, is an idea which does have some experimental confirmation, and the idea um, um, is that when the universe was very, very young, uh, a tiny fraction of a second old, it began expanding uh, exponentially fast, and then after a split second, resumed the leisurely rate of expansion of the standard Big Bang model. Um, and uh, one of the aspects of, of the inflation theory, as it has been developed more and more in the last decades, is that uh, space uh, in this early 
period of time when the universe was a tiny fraction of a second old after the beginning, after the Big Bang, um, that it was filled with a kind of, of energy like the dark energy, and that that dark energy actually had a different value at each different point in space, and each different point in space began expanding very rapidly to form a new universe. Each of those universes was infinite from within, so that it was completely cut off from all the other universes. And this is actually a prediction of uh, the, internal, the eternal inflation model. So there are these two theories in modern physics, uh, string theory and uh, eternal inflation, neither of which has been proven with, with anywhere the near, near the certainty that we know other theories of physics but a lot of very smart men and women are working on these theories and they predict the multiverse. So let's uh, go back to the intelligent fish for a moment. The wise and old fish have conjectured that there are many other worlds, some with dry land and some with water, and they live in a world of water because otherwise they wouldn't exist. So some fish grudgingly accept this explanation. Some are relieved because the problem is solved. And some feel despondent because the ruminations of their life's work have been pointless in trying to prove that everything has to be water. And some of the fish are deeply disturbed and they are deeply disturbed because there is no way that this conjecture that dry land exists in addition to water, there's no way that they can prove this conjecture. They live in the ocean and they have no way of proving or disproving that dry land exists. And that, that uncertainty is what disturbs physicists today. Because not only must we accept that certain properties of our universe, like the strength of the nuclear force and the value of the dark energy, are incalculable, we all also must believe in the existence of a vast number of other universes. But we have no way of observing these other universes. We have no way of proving or disproving their existence. We must believe in what we cannot prove. We must take the existence of the, uh, these other universes as a matter of faith. Um, sound familiar? <laughs> so I think there's a, a delicious irony in this situation that modern science has found itself in. So I've just been speaking about the accidental universe, which is what I call this situation. And what I wanted to do now um, is to read you a short, shortened form of, of another essay in the book. And I don't know whether you can st sit still for a reading, uh, but I've tried to, to shorten it. Um, I hope that you will identify with it. And, um, the title of this essay is called The Temporary Universe. A couple of years ago in August, my oldest daughter got married. The ceremony took place at a farm in the little town of Wells, Maine, against the backdrop of rolling green meadows, a white, and wood, a white wooden barn, and the sounds of a classical guitar. Each member of the wedding party stepped down a sloping hill towards the huppa, while the guests sat in simple white chairs bordered by rows of sunflowers. The air was redolent with the smells of maples and grasses and other growing things. It was a marriage we had all hoped for. Radiant in her white dress, a white dahlia in her hair, my daughter asked to hold my hand as we walked down the aisle. It was a perfect picture of utter joy 
and utter tragedy because I wanted my daughter back as she was at age 10 or 20. As we moved towards that lovely arch that would swallow us all, other scenes flashed through my mind. My daughter in first grade holding a starfish as big as herself, her smile missing a tooth, my daughter on the back of my bicycle as we rode to a river to drop stones in the water, my daughter telling me the day she had her first period. Now she was 30. Now I could see lines in her face. I don't know why we long so for permanence, why the fleeting nature of things so disturbs us. With futility, we cling to the old wallet long after it has fallen apart. We visit and revisit the old neighborhood where we grew up, searching for the remembered grove of trees and the little fence. We clutch our old photographs. In our churches and synagogues and mosques, we pray to the everlasting and eternal. Yet in every nook and cranny, nature screams at the top of her lungs that nothing lasts, that it is all passing away. All that we see around us, including our own bodies, is shifting and evaporating and one day will be gone. Where are the one billion people who lived and breathed in the year 1800, only two short centuries ago? The evidence seems overly clear. In the summer months, mayflies drop by the billions within 24 hours of birth. Drone ants perish, perish in two weeks. Daylilies bloom and then wilt, leaving dead, papery stalks. Ancient stone temples and spires flake in the salty air, fracture and fragment, dwindle to spindly nubs, and eventually dissolve into nothing. Coastlines erode and crumble. Glaciers slowly but surely grind down the land. Once the continents were joined, once the air was ammonia and methane, in the future it will be something else. The sun is depleting its nuclear fuel. And just look at our own bodies. In the middle years and beyond, skin sags and cracks, eyesight fades, hearing diminishes, bones shrink and turn brittle. Physicists call it the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> it's also called the arrow of time. Oblivious to our human yearnings for permanence, the universe is relentlessly wearing down, falling apart, driving itself towards a condition of maximum disorder. It's a question of probabilities. You start from a situation of improbable order, like a deck of cards all arranged according to number and suit, or like a solar system with several planets orbiting nicely around a central star. Then you drop the deck of cards on the floor over and over again. You let other stars randomly whiz by your solar system, jostling it with their gravity. The cards become jumbled, the planets get picked off and go aimlessly wandering through space. Order has yielded to disorder. Repeated patterns have yielded to change. In the end, you cannot defeat the odds. You might beat the house for a while, but the universe has an infinite supply of time and can outlast any player. Consider the world of living things. Why can't we live forever? The life cycles of amoebas and humans are, as everyone knows, controlled by genes in each cell. While the raison d'etre of the majority of genes is to pass on the instructions for how to build a new amoeba or a new human being, an important fraction of genes concerns itself with supervising cellular operations and replacing worn out parts. Some of these genes must be copied thousands of times 
Others are constantly subjected to random chemical storms and electrically unbalanced atoms that disrupt other atoms. Disrupted atoms cannot properly pull and tug on nearby atoms to form the intended bonds and architectural forms. In short, with time, the genes get degraded. They become forks with missing tines. They cannot quite do their job. But despite all the evidence, we continue to strive for youth and immortality. We continue to cling to the old photographs. We continue to wish that our grown daughters were children again. Every civilization has sought the elixir of life, the magical potion that would grant youth and immortality. In China alone, the substance has 1,000 names. It's known in Persia, in Tibet, in Iraq, in the aging nations of Europe. Some call it Amrita, or Ab Ahayat, or Maharas, Mansarova, Chasma Kosar. We pay good money for toupees and tummy tucks, facelifts and breast lifts, hair dyes, skin softeners, penile implants, laser surgeries, Botox treatments, injections for varicose veins. We ingest vitamins and pills and, and anti-aging potions and who knows what else. I recently did a Google search under the heading Products to Stay Young and found 37,200,000 websites. <laughs> What about our sun and other stars? Shakespeare's Caesar says to Cassius, but I am constant as the northern star of whose true fix and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. But Caesar was not up on modern astrophysics or the second law of thermodynamics. The north star and all stars, including our sun, are consuming their nuclear fuel, after which they will fade into cold embers floating in space, or if massive enough, bow out in a final explosion. Our sun will last another five billion years before ending, expending its fuel. Then it will expand enormously into a red gaseous sphere enveloping the Earth, go through a series of convulsions and finally settle down to a cold ball made largely of oxygen and carbon. A day will come when the night sky will be totally black and the day sky will be totally black as well. There will be no more stars left. Solar systems will become planets orbiting dead stars. Buddhists have long been aware of the evanescent nature of the world. Anika, or impermanence, they call it. In Buddhism, Anika is one of the three signs of existence, the others being dukkha, or suffering, and anatta, or non-selfhood. According to the Buddhist scriptures, when the Buddha, Buddha passed away, the king deity Saka uttered the following, Impermanent are all component things. They rise and cease. They come into being and pass away. We, could not attach, we should not attach to things, say the Buddhists, because, because all things are temporary and will soon pass away. And in fact, the Buddhists, and I'm sure that many of you know this, say that all suffering arises from a attachment. If I could only detach from my daughter, maybe I would feel better. Uh, I should have said, if I can only detach from my daughter, I would feel better. But even Buddhists believe there's something akin to immortality. It's called nirvana. A person reaches nirvana after he or she has managed to leave behind all attachments and cravings. And indeed, nearly every religion on earth 
has celebrated this ideal of immortality. To my mind, it is one of the profound contradictions of human existence that we long for immortality, indeed fervently believe that something must be unchanging and permanent when all of the evidence in nature argues against it. Either I am delusional or nature is incomplete. Either I am being emotional and vain in my wish for eternal life for myself and for my daughter, or there's some realm of immortality that exists outside of nature. It has to be one or the other. If the first alternative is right, then I need to have a talk with myself and get over it. After all, there are other things that I yearn for that are either not true or not good for my health. The human mind has a famous ability to create its own reality. If the second alternative is right, then it is nature that has been found wanting. Despite all of the richness of the physical world, the majestic architecture of atoms, the rhythm of the tides, the luminescence of the galaxies, nature is missing something even more exquisite and grand, some immortal substance which lies hidden from view. Such exquisite stuff could not be made from matter because all matter is slave to the second law of thermodynamics. Perhaps this immortal thing that we wish for exists beyond time and space. Of these two alternatives, I am inclined to the first. I just can't believe that nature could be so amiss. Although there's much that we don't understand about nature, the possibility that it is, it is hiding a condition or substance so magnificent and utterly unlike everything else seems too preposterous for me to believe. So I am delusional. In my continual cravings for eternal youth and constancy and permanence, I am being delusional and sentimental. Perhaps with the proper training of my unruly mind and emotions, I could refrain from wanting things that cannot be. Perhaps I could accept the fact that in a few short years, my atoms, atoms will be scattered in soil and wind, my mind and thoughts will be gone, my pleasures and joys vanished, my i dissolved in an infinite cavern of nothingness. But I can't accept this fate even though I believe it to be true. I, I can't force my mind to go to that dark place. Suppose I ask a different kind of question. If against our wishes and hopes we are stuck with mortality, does mortality grant a kind of beauty and grandeur all its own? Even though we struggle and howl against the brief flash of our lives, might we find something majestic in that brevity? Could there be a preciousness and a value to existence stemming from the very fact of its temporary duration? And I think of the night blooming Sirius, a plant that looks like a leathery weed most of the year, but for one night each summer, its flower opens to reveal silky white petals which encircle yellow lace-like threads and another whole flower like a tiny sea anemone within the outer flower. By morning, the flower has shriveled. One night of the year, as delicate and fleeting as a life in the universe. Well, we can either have a few questions now, or I can say um, a few words about um, science and religion. <laughs> okay. Um,
course, science and religion is an enormous, uh, enormous subject, and I, I know many people are interested in it. And, and um, uh, there's one essay in my book about it, and I'm only going to be able to say a little bit about it now because uh, there's not much time left. Um, first of all, um, I'm going to state a viewpoint, and that is that, that I believe that science can neither prove nor prove the existence of God. Um, I think that God lies outside of science. Uh, lie, God la lies outside of, of time and space. Uh, God, as understood by most religions, is not subject to rational analysis. And so um, the, the kind of God that is subscribed to by most religions, I believe, cannot be proven or disproven by science. Um, I wanted to say a few words about the kind of religious belief that would be compatible with science. And uh, before I do that, I have to state something that I call the central doctrine of science, which is that um, all of the phenomena in the physical universe obey laws of nature, and those laws of nature hold everywhere and at all times in the universe. Uh, uh, we're not, uh, my thesis advisor, when I was getting my PhD, uh, did not explicitly state the central doctrine of science, but it was something that was just assumed. Um, it was in the air. Uh, this is something which almost all scientists subscribe to, whether they say it explicitly or not. So then I would say that a, a religious view <clears throat> that is compatible with science and therefore incompatible with the central doctrine of science is one in which God does not uh, interfere with the workings of the physical universe. God does not act in the physical universe in a way to violate the laws of nature. Uh, in other words, God does not perform miracles. Uh, otherwise, the central doctrine of science would be violated. God does not intervene in the physical universe. Now, um, as you know, most religions do not have this kind of God. Um, in Christianity and Judaism, uh, there are the uh, many miracles like the ten plagues on Egypt, in Islam, there's the splitting of the moon uh, by Muhammad, which described in the Quran. Uh, in Hinduism, there are many visitations of Vishnu and the other gods uh, on earth in, in interfering form. So um, most traditional religions uh, in their orthodox form are not compatible with science. Having said that, um, I want to add that the situation is actually much more complicated than that. Um, and let me explain. There are many non-scientists um, who believe in an intervening God and yet also place great value in science. Um, if we didn't place, uh, every time we get up in an airplane, for example, and go somewhere in an airplane, we're putting our trust in, in science, that the laws of physics, aerodynamics, and so on will keep the airplane aloft. So we are, we're putting our lives in the hands of science every time we get an airplane. Um, on the flip side of the co coin, there is a small but vocal group of scientists, maybe about 5%, I estimate, who are scientists and yet believe not only in God, in God, but in an intervening God. And I'll mention just a few of those scientists. Um, I have a colleague at MIT, Ian Hutchinson, professor of nuclear engineering, who fits into this category. I have a colleague at Harvard, Owen Gingrich, professor of astronomy, who also uh, believes in an intervening God. And so you might ask, well, how are these scientists able to reconcile their uh, their, their life in science, their belief in science, also with a belief in an intervening God. 
And the way that they do so is that they feel that science uh, correctly describes the workings of the physical universe most of the time. But every once in a while, God intervenes and violates those laws. And that intervention is not uh, analyzable by the methods of science. <clears throat> so let me say uh, just a few more words. Um, and I, I do want to allow a little time for, for questions. I think that um, in addition to the physical universe, that there is a universe of, of experience uh, that is not fully analyzable by the methods of science. And I'm going to call this the spiritual universe. The spiritual universe may or may not involve the existence of God. Um, for example, when you hear um, Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto, uh, or one of Beethoven's symphonies, the, the feelings, emotion, emotions, associations, connections that you feel on hearing that music, uh, I don't feel are fully analyzable by the methods of science. You could hook up that person's brain uh, and do an MRI scan, and you could chart the electrical activity of every neuron in the brain, and you wouldn't have a real explanation of the experience that that person is going through. So that's what I mean by a transcendent experience. Um, and I'm sure that many of you have had transcendent experiences as well. So I will end my talk there um, and uh, be happy to take a, a few questions. Yes. Has it ever been considered that the multiple universes are like Edison trying to find the tungsten element, or God failing time and time again until he came up with the right one? <laughs> so the, the question is um, has anyone ever considered the possibility of, that the multiple universes are, are gods uh, attempting to come out with a, uh, to produce a, a successful universe? Uh, analogous, analogously to the way that, that Thomas Edison tried many different filaments for the incandescent light before he hit on tungsten. Um, well, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, I, I don't think that we could rule that out. Uh, uh, that's all I can say. It's, 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 it's a... Yes. So I, I think the, the comment is when you see a new phenomena that you, you haven't seen before, how do you know whether that's a miracle or not? Uh, well, that's a great question. And um, uh, it makes me think of a, of, a, of a period in physics in the 1920s when we uh, saw some uh, radioactive decay and it appeared that the energy was not being conserved, that, 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 that uh, physicists up until that point have believed very strongly that the total amount of energy in a closed system is constant and might be converted from heat to light or other forms. And uh, it appeared in this radioactive decay that, that energy was being lost. And uh, this, this caused great uh, uh, consternation among physicists. Uh, some physicists were saying that maybe the law of conservation of energy is really not 
valid as we thought it was. Some said that maybe uh, we don't understand quantum physics. Um, I think, I, I don't know of any prominent physicist who said that maybe it's a miracle. And I think that, that, that the physicists um, and scientists in general are pretty much committed to the central doctrine of science, um, even though we can't prove it to be true. Um, we actually accept the central doctrine of science as a matter of faith. Um, now, what happened in this particular case with this radioactive decay is that um, uh, within a, a, a couple of years, physicists discovered there was actually a previously unobserved particle that was also being emitted called the neutrino, which was, which was accounting for the missing energy. So that actually all of the laws of physics um, were, were remained intact, but we just discovered a new particle that we hadn't known existed before. Um, but it's, it's an excellent question uh, when we see pheno some phenomena that we've never seen before. How do we know whether it's just a bit of science that we don't yet know or whether it's a miracle? Um, it's a great comment, uh, and I think uh, that I would say that, that most of my scientific colleagues are committed uh, as a matter of faith to the central doctrine of science and when they see something that they don't understand, they believe that there will ultimately be a scientific explanation. And um, as far as we know now, with the exception of this fine-tuning problem, um, uh, just about everything that we have observed in the physical universe, we have a, a, a physical explanation for. Um, a vast, vast range of phenomena we are able to explain uh, in terms of, of fundamental laws that appear to be upheld. Um, but that, of course, does not prove uh, that a miracle couldn't happen or hasn't happened. Uh, yes, here. Would I... Um, would, would, would I explain time to a... I, I don't think that I could do that simply. Uh, it's, it's, yes, it's 8.30. <laughs> uh, that, that's, a, that's probably a good place to, uh, to end. I, I, I don't think that I can give a, a, a simple explanation of time uh, except that it, it's, it's uh, a measure of change. Uh, of course, we have a very quantitative theory of the behavior of time, which is Einstein's theory of special relativity. Um, uh, and Einstein took a very pragmatic view of what time was. He didn't try to give any highfalutin philosophical uh, statement of what it was, uh, a Kantian statement definition. He said that time is, is what is measured on things that we call clocks. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll ask my host whether uh, we should uh, allow time for more questions, or what do you guys want to do? Well, take, take a couple more questions. Uh, there's one back there, the lady. Yeah. Yes, well, the, the, uh, the, the, the comment is that, that, Ein, that, that Isaac Newton um, was, was a devout believer and felt that, um, that, that the physical phenomena that he worked with and explained were manifestations of God. Um, that's absolutely true. And uh, uh, the thing is, if you look uh, at at Newton's uh, laws 
and, and uh, detach them from his philosophical beliefs, then you find that those laws work very well uh, on their own without any outside influence. Now, you could take the view that those laws are manifestations of God, and in fact, that, 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 that God is equated uh, or is identical to the laws of nature. Um, that's a pantheistic view, uh, belief, a deist, deist belief, and uh, to me, that uh, is uh, a beautiful idea. Um, it's, it's a sort of a philosophical idea. Um, if you take that belief, that view, then there are no miracles. There's just the laws of nature, and God is acting in the world through the laws of nature. Yes, right here. Well, the uh, well, there are the two theories that I mentioned: string theory and uh, eternal inflation that uh, that indicate other universes. The uh, the the strongest argument that convinces me that that it's something to be taken seriously is the fine tuning problem. And uh, in addition to the strength of the nuclear force and the, the amount of dark energy, there are a number of other parameters that I didn't mention because I wanted to just use a couple of examples that also appear to be finely tuned. That is, if they were a little larger than they actually are in our universe or a little smaller, then you couldn't form uh, complex molecules and atoms and so forth. Y yes, here. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying that anything is preposterous. Uh, we, we, uh, we use the methods of science to map out uh, the physical universe, and we know that we, we believe that there's something called, that we call dark energy because we see the, the galaxies behaving in a certain way. We see the, the galaxies accelerating away from each other. We don't actually see that directly, but we infer that from other observations that we have. Um, so we're, we're staying within the, the metho methodology of science. Um, I think uh, that you made a good point that uh, the, the evidence of God is in our consciousness. Um, I think that, 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 uh, that religion is a much more personal activity than science. Science, uh, we try to be impersonal in science. We, we try to study phenomena that are outside of our bodies we try to uh, measure things, quantify things with rulers and clocks that are independent of, of our bodies. The transcendent experience that I describe, um, which I uh, associate with, with a spiritual universe, that's, that's a highly personal experience. So that's a, a profound difference. Um, but I'm certainly not saying uh, anything is preposterous. I'm just trying to sort of lay out the, the territory. Yep. The, the central doctrine of science, yes. Um, that the physical universe, the phenomena of the physical universe, obey laws, in parentheses, discoverable by human beings, and that those laws hold everywhere and for all times in the universe. Does this impact behavior or morality? Um, great, great question. Um, well, I think that, that it would have to um, because I believe that we are material things. Um, our, our, our brains, of course, are enormously complicated, and we don't 
there's a, a tremendous amount about the brain that we don't understand, memory, uh, decision making, all kinds of things. But um, I do think that the brain is ultimately material, and I believe that the, the uh, neurons of the brain do obey the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology. But I think that it is uh, such an enormously complicated system um, that uh, in practice that it, it is almost impossible to predict how a person will react in every different situation. Um, we're not closed systems. Um, there are uh, influences coming from the outside all the time which are changing our, our mental state uh, and uh, in very complicated ways. So I think the system, the, the, we're not a closed system and we're sufficiently complicated that I think that even though cause and effect always hold, that, that in practice, the, all of the influences that are related to the causes are so complicated and so difficult to enumerate that uh, there's a certain unpredictability. So I don't know whether that that's, I mean, the, 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 uh, you know, the interesting question is free will. Do we have free will or not? And, and, and that, of course, a lot of uh, ethical behavior assumes that we have free will. Our, our criminal justice system assumes that we have free will. Um, and uh, the, the question to ask, and, and you've asked it, um, is um, if uh, we are a, a purely material system, uh, just a collection of atoms and molecules that obey physical laws, do we have free will? Do we, are we really making independent decisions or are our decisions already determined by the laws of chemistry, biology and physics and so on? I'll, I'll take one more question. Um, I haven't asked anybody in the back, uh, somebody, but someone close to will have to repeat the question because I, I probably won't hear it from here. Maybe you could come down to the front uh, if you have a, a back and have a question so that I can hear it. Good. So is it correct in saying that if there are an infinite amount of universes and any circumstances were possible in those universes, that the circumstances in our universe that accommodate for life are simply bound to happen? Follow the Murphy's Law? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.